Very good. <laughs> uh, I am Brenda Wright. I'm the director of the Democracy Program here at Demos, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to the New York launch of Jeff Clement's timely, powerful, and really indispensable book, Corporations Are Not People. And I think you really have to admire an author whose book title is itself an applause line. <laughs> I think uh, actually everybody who is here today also deserves some applause for braving the weather to be here uh, at 8 a.m. and to uh, basically pack the house. There's, there's really no better sign of the tremendous importance of the issues that we're going to discuss here today. Demos is very proud to be hosting this event together with Free Speech for People and the New York chapter of the American Constitution Society. Demos' mission and purpose is to build a more democratic and equitable America that promotes the common good. Two years ago, in the case of Citizens United versus FEC, the US Supreme Court issued a decision that somehow managed to pose a direct threat and challenge to every one of those values. The court declared that corporations which are artificial entities wholly created by state law, have the same First Amendment right to spend money in the electoral arena as actual living human beings. For Demos, as for so many organizations and individuals across the ideological divide, this proposition is simply intolerable. It denies the fundamental principle of self-government on which our democracy is founded. It replaces the Constitution's purpose of promoting the general welfare with the corporation's purpose of adding to the bottom line. It denies what is best about our nation, its leadership as a beacon of democracy and the exemplar of government of, by, and for the people. And the damage from this opinion has become apparent in the very first election that was held after Citizens United. In the 2010 elections, Outside groups spent over 280 million to influence federal elections. That was more than double what these groups spent in 2008 and more than five times what they spent in the previous midterm elections. And among the 10 groups that did the most outside political spending in 2010, only three disclosed their funders. This undisclosed outside spending in 2010 is obviously just a taste of what we're going to see in 2012. But today's event uh, is part of something very important because the second anniversary of Citizens United is not just an opportunity to mourn what we lost in 2010. It's an, an opportunity, I think, to celebrate beginning signs that we, the people, are ready to fight back. We've seen that in the Occupy Wall Street movement. We see that in the national discourse. People throughout the country are starting to make the connection between the economic pain that they are feeling and the deficits in our democracy embodied in decisions like Citizens United. Making that connection is part of what Demos is all about. And it's why we're so excited about today's event. So today's event is going to be exploring how we got to this place uh, and also some of the ways in which people can respond and push back against what the Supreme Court did in 2010. So just to explain how this is going to go today, uh, I'm going to introduce Bob Herbert and our author, Jeff Clements, and then I'll ask John Bonifaz uh, of Free Speech for People to say a few words of welcome uh, before we proceed to today's discussion. And the discussion will, will be uh, one in which Bob is essentially going to interview Jeff on the terrific book that he's written. We'll have some time for questions uh, at the end, and you are very welcome and encouraged to stay uh, after we close uh, purchase a book and 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 talk with us uh, uh, after we're done. So with that, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Bob Herbert as the moderator of this discussion. Uh, of course, you all know that Bob Herbert uh, is now a distinguished senior fellow at Demos, but some of you may also know that he was a New York Times columnist uh, for many years. <laughs> uh, 
Bob's incredibly distinguished career uh, as a journalist has included teaching journalism at Brooklyn College and the Columbia University School of Journalism. Uh, the numerous awards that he has received uh, for his work are really too many to mention, but I, I have to mention just one of them because I like it so much. <laughs> he won the Rittenhauer Courage Prize, which is awarded for the fearless articulation of unpopular truths. <laughs> And that is why we treasure and value him so much as part of the Demos family. And then finally, I, I'm very happy to introduce our author today, Jeff Clements. Uh, Jeff uh, is an attorney and author and the co-founder of Free Speech for People. He's the author of our book today, Corporations Are Not People. He's also the founder of the Clements Law Office and has represented and advocated for people, businesses, and the public interest since 1988. Jeff served as Assistant Attorney General and Chief of the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office from 2007 to 2009. And as Bureau Chief, he led more than 100 attorneys and staff in litigation in areas of civil rights, environmental protection, health care, insurance, financial services, antitrust, and consumer protection. And he was critically involved in the uh, tobacco, the litigation against the tobacco industry, which plays such an uh, important and interesting role in the book that he's written. We are delighted to have him here with us today for his New York book launch. Um, I do want to encourage people to purchase a copy of the book if you haven't done so already. Um, one other housekeeping uh, item is that on your chair, I hope everybody had a, a little survey that we passed out. And we're just asking people to fill out that very, very brief survey because we're experimenting with uh, these breakfast events for the first time and we'd like to know uh, how people uh, uh, think that, that how they work. Um, so with no further ado, I want to introduce John Bonifaz, the founder of Free Speech for People and a longtime friend and colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. That's co-founder with Jeff Clements of Free Speech for People. Uh, I'm honored to be here with all of you today, and Free Speech for People is honored to co-sponsor this event with Demos and the American Constitution Society. Uh, we are a national nonpartisan campaign launched on the day of the Citizens United ruling, moments after it was issued, to call for a 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution to make clear that corporations are not people with constitutional rights, and we've been at it now uh, for two uh, plus years. Uh, I um, have been privileged to work uh, with Jeff during this time. I got to know him uh, when I had learned that he was authoring uh, an amicus brief before the Supreme Court in Citizens United after it had noticed for re-argument uh, for a new argument in September 2009 on these sweeping questions of whether it should overturn a century of precedent dealing with corporate money and elections. Uh, and Jeff is really the Tom Paine of our time. He sounded the alarm in that summer of 2009 with that amicus brief, and now with his book, Corporations Are Not People, he is sounding it again for all of us to come together and reclaim that basic promise of America, government of, for, and by the people. Uh, and this conversation with Bob, who's been such a uh, eloquent voice for questions of justice and democracy for years in this country, this conversation is a critically important one uh, for the nation and for our time. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to them. But thank you all for being here uh, this morning for this, for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, good morning. I just want to echo Deborah and um, thank everyone for coming out on a um, rainy morning like this. It reminds me a little bit of my days long ago in parochial school in New Jersey when you'd be in the classroom on kind of a damp and dank um, day, but a little more comfortable here actually than at Immaculate Conception Grammar School. So. <laughs> uh, we're here to talk about a uh, wonderful book about corporations having the rights of personhood, uh, but not the responsibilities of citizenship. And um, uh, Jeff, congratulations um, on, um, on your book and uh, welcome 
today, and let's start right with that title. I mean, corporations are not people. You can have a lot of fun with that phrase, but in essence, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, you, you, you can have a lot of fun with the phrase, and you, I probably won't win the uh, fearlessness award for that <laughs> title because it's something I think that, uh, you know, 90% plus of the American people understand and get. Um, unfortunately, five justices on the Supreme Court <laughs> don't, don't get it. And so what I, what I mean by that phrase is, is really, I think, we're facing now, Bob, a, um, a, a struggle of power. It's a power struggle in the country between corporate power and the, uh, as, as John Boniface said, the uh, government of, for, and by the people. And it's, um, it's something that is, is not new. Uh, it's a new version of it, but it's something that I think is part of being American. It goes back to the, to the founding uh, generation of, of, of whether this improbable experiment can succeed, whether, whether government of the people can actually work. And frequently it is a struggle, especially since the Gilded Age and the end of the 19th century, with corporate power. Corporations get a lot of benefits and privileges from the state. They're state-created entities, though. And in the early days of, of corporations, we kept a very close eye on them. I say in the book, they're really more like tools than people. They're, they're like gasoline or, or uh, guns or lawnmowers. They're, they're very effective tools when used for what they're supposed to be used for, but they're dangerous if you don't keep an eye on them. And, um, you know, we, this, this book and, and this moment is really about let's get our eye back on the power of corporations and, and, and get away from this rhetoric that the Supreme Court has fallen into where their corporations are referred to as voices, speakers, literally persons, people. In the Citizens United case, the, uh, Justice Kennedy, who wrote the opinion, uh, referred to corporations as a disadvantaged class of persons. <laughs> it says, uh, says something about how far away we've gotten from the, the truth that they're not people, they're economic entities that we, the people, decide to allow limited liability, perpetual life, things that are advantages to help generate economic growth, but very grave dangers if we don't confine them to the economic sphere and watch their grasp for power in the political sphere. They do have uh, perpetual life, so if they in fact are people, I would not characterize that as a disadvantage. Um, but we've, we've now spent uh, more than a year in the post-Citizens United era. What are some of the practical effects? What have we seen? Well, I, I think there's, uh, there's two answers to that, Bob. One is it's, we're, we're approaching the second anniversary now of the Citizens United decision. It'll be on January 20th. And one answer is what has Citizens United itself meant? But the other answer, which I, I try to um, develop in my book, is where did Citizens United come from and how much of a price we have already paid in our society for this idea of corporate rights? Citizens United, I, uh, in many ways, is sort of the end zone dance or the, uh, <laughs> you know, the spike of the ball for the, for the winners, uh, which is corporate power. And, um, and so the, sh the first answer is what has Citizens United done most immediately? By striking down the McCain-Feingold law, uh, which, which many people in this room have worked very hard to win that success and was so important. Um, it struck down the piece of McCain-Feingold that prohibited corporations from engaging in ex independent expenditure campaigns, uh, the kind we're seeing now with the super PACs, uh, with their corporate general treasury funds. And the core of that law actually went back to 1907. We had a century of law saying that corporations should not be using corporate money to influence our elections. That was what is at stake. Citizens United threw that away, uh, recklessly in my view, threw that away, overturning a case, McConnell versus FEC, that had been decided only in 2003. What had, what had changed since McConnell in 2003 said that regulating corporate money in elections was an important piece of American uh, jurisprudence and, and, and government? Uh, the only thing that changed is Samuel Alito joined the court and Chief Justice Roberts joined the court. <laughs> Chief Justice Rehnquist, who opposed the idea of corporate rights, died. Sandra Day O'Connor retired. So that's not how jurisprudence is supposed to work, but the result has been as Brenda said in the 2010 election, the most expensive midterm election in the history of America, at least $135 million, maybe more, of undisclosed, unknown, 
funding and we can't even say what amount of corporate funding because there's no disclosure requirement. There's no reporting requirement. Uh, so, so corporate money flowed in uh, in 2010 and now we're seeing a, a, a huge expansion of that with the super PACs because they, they're very useful vehicles for, again, disguising where the money's coming from, driving corporate money into elections. And it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. I think, you know, at Free Speech for People, we pointed out how that essentially the takedown of Newt Gingrich was a super PAC funded campaign and, and personally I'm no fan of Newt Gingrich but I'd rather the people <laughs> decide for themselves rather than a four million dollar you know ad buy in a small state like Iowa which just actually overwhelms any kind of voice that the people had. So the most immediate effect is we're seeing a, just a, a lawlessness, a, a wave of of uh, money and corporate money and corporate interest swamping our political system. And this is the presidential race. Remember, Citizens United affects every election, all the way down to school district. I mean, corporate money, and according to Citizens United, we cannot regulate corporate spending in elections in any election. And a lot of elections, uh, a lot of states have judicial elections, which is very troubling to know that corporate money can decide what kind of justice we're going to get. So great irony here is that you take this bogus concept of corporate speech, but it's overwhelming the real and important idea of protected speech of real citizens in this country. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely right. And one, one of the big problems is the, uh, by pretending essentially that corporations speak uh, rather than engage in business, by pretending that corporations are people, we are swamping and, and, and squelching the voice of the real people. And that's always a problem with money in politics. Um, it's, it's long been a problem, um, as, as folks here know, that those with more money have a louder voice. But when you open it up to corporations with literally trillions of dollars in global revenue, with complex and unknown shareholder structures, including uh, some sovereign states, the number two shareholder in UBS is the Republic of Singapore, uh, and you have these corporations unleashing money without disclosure, it's no longer just the bad enough problem of money equaling more speech and, and, and those with less money having less speech. All of us uh, are losing our, our voice in our, in our systems. So you've taken on the <laughs> small task of amending the U.S. Constitution. Uh, what would the 28th Amendment do? Uh, well, I, I, I will answer that. I just want to first, if I could, say sure. the, the second part of the Citizens United oh. answer because it, it actually, the amendment gets at this problem. It's, it's not just money in politics. It's not just elections. It's a, as I said, it's a power struggle. And um, we, even before Citizens United, we had environmental laws struck down, public health laws struck down, financial regulation laws struck down. Just it, the, the idea of corporate speech has been wielded since 1978 uh, increasingly to essentially hollow out the public interest laws uh, that we have in our country. And so that is new. It's radical. It was created, as, as I describe in the book, by uh, Justice Lewis Powell, a, a, who had been a lawyer for the tobacco industry and for the Chamber of Commerce. Before he went on the court, he outlined this plan to create this doctrine to the chamber. We didn't know it at the time. It was undisclosed to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The American people didn't know it, but he'd outlined a plan to create corporate rights to the Chamber of Commerce and then got on the Supreme Court appointed by Richard Nixon <laughs> and did exactly that. So we call at Free Speech for People, joined by millions of Americans and other organizations, to overturn that creation of something that, that never existed in American history. It's a fabricated constitutional doctrine uh, that, that turns the things that we create and control, corporations, against us and uh, has no place in a government of the people. So the 28th Amendment would say that when we say person or people in the Constitution, we mean people and person. And <laughs> we don't mean corporations. Uh, it, it, it would uh, simply return the Constitution to what it has always meant, which is a we the people, a Bill of Rights for people. Corporations are economic entities subject to regulation, subject to the decisions of the majority of the people without the Bill of Rights to be used to essentially have a trump card over, over policy. And uh, if the amendment uh, were to succeed, if, if, it, if it passed, uh, what would you imagine the practical consequences would be? Well, I think the, the practical consequences 
in part come from winning that struggle. Because if we win that struggle, as I know we will, we, we will overturn Citizens United. We will either have <laughs> so it I done. I was going to ask you how the campaign is going. It's, it's going and what very the prospects well. were. I guess that question's out the window. You're going to win. Yeah, we are going to win. You don't need to ask that. It's going to happen. <laughs> and I can tell you why. Um, we, we've, got, uh, we, we've got a uh, probably two million people now have signed on to resolutions. We've got growing waves of organizations. We've got Business for Democracy. Ben Cohen's in the room. He's one of the leaders of the Business for Democracy movement. Thousand business leaders have signed on to this campaign for a constitutional amendment. Attorneys generals are now joining the fight. Martha Coakley of Massachusetts has endorsed the amendment campaign. Steve Bullock in Montana is pushing back where we did an amicus brief to say that Citizens United is wrong. The, the Supreme Court of Montana essentially agreed. In that case, we'll be going to the Supreme Court. There is a wave of resistance and in some ways defiance, appropriate defiance, of this notion that we are subject to corporate rule. And so we are seeing, there's a dozen amendment resolutions now in Congress. Uh, we are just seeing incredible momentum. And it is bringing people together from the right, from the left. We're sort of putting off some of our policy disagreements to work together on the thing we all agree on, which is we need, we need to have government of the people to, so we get a fair argument about what policy choices we might decide upon rather than a corporate, on the right, they sort of call it crony capitalism, you know, right. a corp big government, big corporation alliance. And so we have great common ground. That's why I think it's going to happen. And by bringing that together um, in this constitutional amendment campaign, we may get a change in the court that'll reverse this disastrous doctrine just by showing the country's rejection of it will win the amendment, and by restoring essentially the lost um, notion that we are a, a people who have a public interest. It's not just about private gain. It's not just about you know hustle and manipulate and use advantages of the government to get, to, to, to get rich at the expense of your neighbors, that, that, that we're in this together. Um, we'll bring along a wave of other way overdue reform in energy and healthcare and everywhere else. And I say that because we've done it before. I mean, we had four constitutional amendments between 1913 and 1921. One of them was kind of dumb, uh, <laughs> prohibition. <laughs> but the others were really good. We elected senators directly for the first time. We overturned a Supreme Court that said we can't have a progressive income tax in this country. And if you think my campaign's hard, our campaign's hard, imagine trying to campaign for <laughs> the income tax amendment so we can tax ourselves. And, but they won that. And women got the right to vote. But remember, the Progressive Era, they did four amendments in such a short time that they got civil rights laws, they got antitrust laws, they got economic regulation that made more sense for the 20th century, they got environmental laws. So essentially, it was a reshaping for a new century to make America work again. And I think we're badly in need of that now. I think Americans get that. The 21st century is different than the 19th and 20th century, but we're still using these sort of 19th and 20th century corporate power structures uh, to, to move forward, and that's why we're not moving forward. So I think we're going to see the practical effects being not just the amendment, but a wave of a renewal of American democracy. One of the, um, you know, you took a topic that's um, very difficult and that a lot of people in the in, in media feel, have felt is um, boring, uh, don't want to touch. You don't see much about it on television. You have made it uh, a really a really compelling read. I mean, this this is not a boring book. It's a fascinating book, and one of the um, most fascinating aspects uh, or issues that I saw in it was the juxtaposition of Lewis Powell and William Rehnquist, two alleged conservatives uh, uh, on the Supreme Court, um, who took diametrically opposing views uh, on this important issue. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it, it is. It is fascinating. I hadn't fully appreciated that distinction until I until I uh, was working through this book. Um, you know, it, those of you who are uh, uh, skeptical about Justice Rehnquist's conservative career uh, start here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> take another look um, because you know Justice Lewis Powell has this reputation as the moderate, the careful. You know. Uh, middle of the road kind of uh, judge, and and William Rehnquist has this reputation of extreme conservative. Uh, the irony is, it w uh, Lewis Powell was the radical. <laughs> he was a radical corporatist who created. He wrote four of, after writing the memo to the chamber before he got on the court. He authored four 
key decisions in, on the court that essentially created the corporate speech right, something that didn't used to exist. And uh, it overturned a law here in New York in the Central Hudson case where New York policy was utility corporations should stop promoting energy consumption because there's an energy conservation policy in the state. That was struck down, written by Lewis Powell, as a violation of the free speech rights of the Central Hudson Utility Corporation. So if the public so, was interested in conservation, but the corporations were interested for reasons of profit in using ever more energy, there's no way to regulate, in, in this instance, corporations from pushing ahead full bore and just overwhelming the efforts to conserve. Yeah, exactly right, and, and here we are 30 years later, uh, we know the situation with global warming. We now import 60% of our oil compared to 35% in the 70s. Things got much worse because if, and a, a tool of democracy, conservation, was essentially taken away from us. Now in that case though, William Rehnquist wrote a passionate dissent. <laughs> Another case, Bilotti of, in, in, in Massachusetts struck down a law that said that corporations should stay out of citizen referenda. Justice Rehnquist wrote a passionate dissent in Lewis Powell, to Lewis Powell's uh, majority opinion. These two gentlemen were appointed by Richard Nixon literally on the same day. And, and Powell's seen essentially by uh, many, if not most Americans, as the good guy right. if there w was such a thing among the two and, and Rehnquist the villain. That's right, and, and, but if you read Rehnquist's, Justice Rehnquist's dissent, they're passionate, clear expositions of this notion that corporations are tools of the economic, of economic policy. In the Bilotti case, he said that, uh, the, 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 um, that unlike corporations, the people answer to a higher uh, authority <laughs> than the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and that that makes a difference. So there's a very strong conservative argument that, that the idea of treating corporations as people uh, is, is, not on, is, is contrary to a Republican democracy of, of, of self-governing people and a, a, a grave threat even if you think you want small government, uh, you know, civic society and, and it's a danger there. So we get Justice Rehnquist as a spokesman on the, on the right uh, for this uh, traditional American view that corporations are subject to our control rather than vice versa and of course there's many on the, on the left. Um, and you know, Justice Stevens, if I may add a footnote to this, he wrote an incredibly powerful dissent in Citizens United. I commend it to everybody if, if you haven't read it. Uh, we've, we've kind of shifted of, to the idea of what is left now. Justice Stevens is considered this <laughs> know. liberal judge. He was appointed by Gerald Ford. <laughs> he was a Republican. Uh, he was an antitrust lawyer for corporations. Uh, so, so you know, I don't know what's really happened to Demos. Our champions are like uh, Lewis Powell, and <laughs> Justice Stevens. But go ahead. But it was a passionate dissent, and I guess my point is, if 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 I did anything with the book, I very much hope to bring this notion that corporate personhood, corporations aren't people, in from the cold to the mainstream, because that's what it is. It's mainstream American thinking that we've forgotten, and both in law schools and in, in among law firms and on the bench with the judges, it became kind of a fringe, strange thing, and we paid a, a terrible price for that. So. The um, Powell was more or less a, s a stealth uh, candidate uh, for the court because his memo couldn't have been clearer about his views uh, regarding corporate uh, power. And, um, uh, you know, all you have to do is start there and you'll get very quickly to the idea of corporate personhood uh -huh. in, in Powell's perspective. And yet he does go on the court as um, uh, perceived as a, as a moderate. And I think you said that at the time of his confirmation hearings, um, the memo never, never even came up. So why was this? How did this happen? Well, it was, it was secret. <laughs> and uh, what, what Lewis Powell did, he was a lawyer in Richmond, Virginia for the tobacco industry. He was on the boards of a dozen uh, lar very large corporations, including Philip Morris. Uh, and he was an advisor to the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, he viewed at the time, 1970, uh, a free enterprise was under attack in his views. And by that he meant, um, citing by name in his memo to the chamber, Ralph Nader for working on <laughs> consumer protection laws. The, we had, after 1970's Earth Day, a wave of environmental laws. We forget EPA, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, Hazardous Waste Substances Act, over and over, just passed 
after 20 million people came out into the streets on Earth Day, Richard Nixon in the White House, bipartisan, and we got an incredible uh, step forward with environmental controls. Uh, that was part of the attack on free enterprise in Lewis Powell's view. And he called in this memo that he wrote for the chamber, as, as you say, Bob, um, very explicitly to use what he called an activist-minded Supreme Court or getting corporations across America to organize to create constitutional rights for corporations to get essentially a trump card over this these attacks which I think most people would call democracy rather than <laughs> right. an attack on free enterprise <laughs> but he very explicitly called for changing the political social and economic structure to be more favorable to corporate America and uh, it was a secret memo to the chamber they they, uh, I was at the Lewis Powell Archives at, um, in, in, in Virginia and at um, Washington and Lee University where he went to law school. And there's, the memo came out after he got on the bench, a Jack Anderson column, uh, it somehow was leaked. And there's this letter of apology to Lewis Powell from the chamber <laughs> saying, we're sorry that we put you to this embarrassment because you know, somehow it got out, it was intended to be secret. So they <coughs> wanted to cover it up. They didn't disclose it to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, nobody knew at the time that he had this radical agenda. And he sailed through as a sort of mainstream establishment uh, nominee after Richard Nixon had a couple of nominees fail, he sailed through essentially 98 to 1 in the Senate and was confirmed. So when you talk about um, when you made the reference to the end zone dance, this long campaign which started uh, uh, at about this time, uh, at about the time that Powell went on the court, um, has succeeded mightily and in, in to the point that corporate power affects our lives now um, almost, almost every aspect of our lives, uh, frankly. Can you talk a little bit about the influence that corporations have, not just on um, policies, but on the lives of ordinary people in this country now? Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think the most uh, pressing one right now is the economy uh, and, and, and the job losses and the economic meltdown of 2008. Um, there is a uh, tendency to um, sometimes think, oh, if, if you're against the idea of corporate rights or corporate personhood, you're somehow against business. And uh, you know, Ben Cohen and, and, and many other business leaders show the lie of that, that, it, that corporate uh, rights actually favor only the smallest slice, the biggest global corporations, uh, and, and disfavor startup businesses, uh, disfavor small businesses, and disfavor American workers, uh, where we no longer can get, uh, can balance the economic uh, might of large corporations with what's in the interest of all the people. So, you know, one of the stories I tell is the, the Citigroup merger with Travelers in, in, during the Clinton administration. And, uh, and, and it, it has been, a, frankly, a bipartisan creation right. uh, over these past 30 years of this, this sort of corporate power problem. And we had, um, you know, we had the Glass-Steagall Act, as many people know, for 50 years from the Great Depression that kept careful firewalls between the trading on Wall Street and the savings and mortgages of Americans because we had learned in the Great Depression that if a panic starts, there's no way to stop it, and, and we have the meltdown. But we prevented a meltdown for 50 years. <laughs> Citigroup wanted to merge with travelers, uh, as I said, during the Clinton administration. It was illegal to do that under the under the Glass-Steagall Act. Citigroup is one of the biggest uh, lobbying machines in Washington, <laughs> incredible corporate power. And they said, yeah, we know the merger is illegal, but we think the law is going to change. <laughs> and, sure, and sure enough, uh, everybody got to work in Washington, and they changed the law. Robert Rubin, Bob Rubin was Treasury Secretary at the time. They had a meeting with Bob Rubin and, and Bill Clinton. Um, uh, the Treasury Secretary helped get the repeal of Glass-Steagall done. It was repealed. Uh, he then, s shockingly, in my view, it's a, I'm amazed it's, it's not a bigger scandal. It's repealed after the, uh, the, the, the merger w was underway. That's right. Merger for, illegal merger first. <laughs> first, then the repeal. You need to repeal right. the law to allow the illegal merger to happen. Um, Bob Rubin then left the Treasury Secretary, and lo and behold, he joined Citigroup. <laughs> and he, he, left, he left the board of uh, Citigroup in 2009 after the almost predictable disaster to the global economy 
and by that time, he had been paid $126 million by Citigroup, by this entity that is almost a poster child for the too big to fail, out of control, untouchable Wall Street bank. And, uh, and so the stories of those are, are being told every day about the power problem there with the, those who've lost their homes, those who've lost their jobs. Um, I tell other stories uh, in Appalachia, uh, West Virginia. I learned you say Appalachia. I used to say Appalachia, but I went down to West Virginia. <laughs> I learned it just now. They reminded me. Uh, they, they said, here's how you remember. If you say Appalachia, we're going to throw an Appalachia. <laughs> so it's Appalachia. I was in West Virginia. And it's, it, you just cannot believe. Uh, West Virginia, you know, our Constitution guarantees a Republican government to the states. They've lost a Republican government. The Massey Energy and the coal companies run West Virginia. Uh, 500 <coughs> mountains that used to exist in Appalachia are gone. They're literally gone to, for mountaintop coal removal, which is cheaper. You don't need as many workers than underground coal mining. So they rip the mountains off and they dump them into the rivers. And so we have 2,500 miles of streams gone. Nobody in West Virginia wants it. They've gone from uh, 165,000 mine workers in the 60s and 70s to 20,000. So it's not like this creates jobs, just the opposite. But nobody, they're untouchable because of corporate contributions, corruption of the justice system. Massey essentially funded a campaign. They have elected judges in West Virginia. They had a $50 million judgment against Massey Energy. The CEO of Massey, a guy named Don Blankenship, funded a campaign to remove the justice who would have decided the case, put in his own justice, who wrote the decision by one vote to vacate that judgment against Massey Energy. It's, a, it's essentially a, a lawless place, and the stories are just terrible. You see people, they've lost their homes. They, can't, they drive 50 miles to get bottled water when they used to drink mountain spring water. There's a guy, I tell the story of, of a fellow who built a fish pond for the kids to fish in because there were no more fish in the streams that have been ruined by this industry. And they started mountaintop removal behind his house, and he said, oh, don't, you know, they told him, you're, you're going to lose everything. And he said, no, they, there's laws, governmental protect me. It's my property. It's my fish pond. And when, sure enough, his home got covered in dust, his fish pond silted up with the mountain that they'd removed behind his house and was dead, and he called the, the West Virginia DEP. They told him to fill it in, that with, with, it's, it was hopeless, and that he should essentially move on with his life. And, and that is sort of mac a, a microcosm of what we're seeing as a country where our government is no longer there for us because it's, it's now responding to big corporate power. Well, you're getting um, very close to the point that uh, Bill Moyers uh, made, actually, I think, in the uh, introduction to your uh, forward to your book, um, about the fact that Citizens United and this long push toward ever-increasing corporate power is just getting us closer and closer, if, if not on the verge, of actually having a plutocracy here. Uh, is, do you agree with that? Is that, is that an... Uh, uh, an exaggeration for effect, or do we really need to be worried that our democracy is at risk here? Um, I, I learned a long time ago not to disagree with Bill Moyer. <laughs> <laughs> he is, I was very honored to have him write the foreword to the book, and he's been a truth teller, in my view, for a long time uh, in America. He doesn't exaggerate. He doesn't uh, sort of play games. And when he says that, I think he means it, and I think he is right that. Uh, um, you know, we, we tend to assume somehow democracy will always be there, that it'll always work, and, and, it, and that's not the case. And uh, plutocracy is very real as a, as a phenomenon in, in, in human existence. And James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, much of it, and, and was obviously a key player in the, in the drafting and the, and the early founding of the Republic, uh, has in Federalist Number 10, it's a famous piece on faction and how you have to control faction or democracy will fail. And by faction, he meant a minority or a majority empowered by a common interest that's adverse to the interests of the, of the American people or the national interest. And so the whole Constitution structure was designed to recognize that faction's going to happen, but there'll be so many competing factions that will get this, this um, rough uh, compromise kind of system of, of, of voting and, and policy making based on different factions competing. We now have one faction. It's corporate power. It's, a, and they're all, it's exactly as Madison said, motivated by a common intense interest. And the amazing thing is we created 
the, the, the biggest power of it, which is <laughs> limited liability and perpetual life and relatively unaccountability, so that generation after generation, they keep going and the people have to relearn and try to contain it. And so that faction is a grave threat to democracy. And, and it's a very powerful faction that now, uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say if we don't reverse Citizens United, if we don't reverse the idea of corporate rights and we don't, again, all of us take responsibility to manage these very dangerous tools, uh, you know, democracy will be, a sh it's sort of getting that way already, a show. You know, we put on the show every four years, uh, but do we really get substantive change? And, and that's not how democracy is supposed to work. So this really seems to be a, a case of the tail wagging the dog. A uh, democratic republic um, creates these entities, creates these uh, corporations, and then the corporations become so powerful, <laughs> like Dr. Uh. Frankenstein's monster, um, that it begins to take over the democratic processes uh, itself. Yeah. So um, how can people help you fight this issue? Well, I think uh, many ways. Um, we need the constitutional amendment, the People's Rights Amendment, and the place to find out more about that is freespeechforpeople.org. Uh, join the campaign. Uh, we're, we're fighting for the amendment. We're fighting in Montana. We led the brief in there and the amicus briefs that led to that momentous decision where the Montana Supreme Court pushed back. Um, join if you're in business. Join Business for Democracy. You can find out more th about that at Free Speech for People and the American Sustainable Business Council that we're working with. Essentially, bring to the table whatever you got. You know, for me, it was my, my law and, I, and my book that I put out there. For many others, it's whatever you got to bring to the table. If you're a business person, bring those skills to the table. Um, if you, what, you know, if, if, if you have nothing else, go join Occupy <laughs> and stand, <laughs> stand in Zuccotti Park. I think that's the kind of spirit we're seeing in America, that people are bringing whatever they've got to the table to say, you know, if this is going to happen, I'm going to go down with a fight. I'm not just going to get rolled over. And so there's many ways to get involved. We're going to be doing campaigns for resolutions, constitutional amendment resolutions. New York City, the city council recently passed a resolution condemning Citizens United, calling for a constitutional amendment. There's other groups as well working on this, Public Citizen, People for the American Way, and uh, move to amend many others. So find, uh, you can find out about them at uh, my blog, corporationsarenotpeople.com, <laughs> has links to all of these. But I, uh, you know, and, and Demos, of course, is right in the fight too, and doing tremendous, tremendous work. Um, so there's many different ways to get involved. We'll get the resolutions done. We're going to get state-based resolutions. Call uh, your Congress people and ask them to join uh, uh, Representative McGovern on the People's Rights Amendment in Congress and keep speaking out, uh, you know, because a lot of it is language. It, that's why the book's called Corporations Are Not People. We have to keep reminding ourselves and our justices and our leaders that we don't buy these metaphors that have led us to such harm, uh, that corporations are not people, they're not voices, they're not disadvantaged. They're these legal <laughs> tools that we create. And we can change those laws, too. That's the other thing is, you know, we got to unfortunately get more involved in corporate law, which sounds boring. <laughs> it's actually uh, one of the most important things we can do is redefine corporations and corporate laws to make them accountable. Uh, most of the corporations in the stock exchange now are from out of Delaware. Why are 900,000 people in Delaware getting to say what the rules are for 310 million Americans? That doesn't make sense. So we, we need to look at things like national standards for corporations. They used to have 20-year charter limits where after 20 years, the corporation would have to come back and say what they've done for the people in, in exchange for all those benefits we gave them. Maybe 20 years is too short, maybe it's not. We should have a debate about that and say, you know, these are public entities. Come back and report before you renew all these advantages that you have. And, and, and let's make sure that these tools are being used to benefit the public and not just a very small slice of uh, the 1%, if you will. Um, I, I thought one of the most um, scandalous passages in your book had to do with what you call uh, corporate university companies, essentially yeah. these for-profit colleges. Um, how does that work? And um, it sounds like one of the, to me, like one of the big scams I've ever heard of. So tell us about that. Uh, you know, it's a terrible s scam, and it's, and it's actually very sad uh, to, to read these stories. Um, 
there's essentially a whole new phenomenon you might know about of, of Wall Street funded privatized universities that are fueled almost entirely by, by the uh, public treasury. Uh, so we have student loan programs and uh, we have now opened the floodgates to Wall Street buying up small, you know, obscure colleges uh, and taking over their college charter, if you will, and then getting, turning, say I, I described one, one, one university uh, was, was t taken from about uh, 700 students to 78,000 students. Now how do they do that? <laughs> it's all online. 80% of the students are gone after the first year, and they've taken most of the money that, that from Wall Street investors to essentially turn it into a recruiting engine. It's like a Ponzi scheme. More students, more funds from the federal government, billions of dollars. And this is another where, one where we'll have right and left coming together. It's a big government, if you will, scam. I mean, ta billions of dollars of tax dollars being funded to these Wall Street-based uh, schools, if you will, they're not educating students, they're leaving them gone after a year indebted, those students are on the hook for that debt, and they've, got, they've taken the federal money already, and uh, they, they're providing no education, and it's a massive problem. Senator Carl Levin is leading an investigation in the Senate. I, I, I refer to, to that investigation in the book, but I, you know, check it out online, the stories they tell are unbelievable, and the CEO of one of these uh, entities called Bridgewater uh, was paid $20 million, <laughs> even though 80% of the students never graduated. And, and uh, th so, so that's, that's pay for performance by Wall Street standards, <laughs> because by the Wall Street play was actually getting profit. And they did, they got a ton of profit because it was essentially free money. Right. And, and so it, it, it just, it, it's another example where corporate power in Washington led to essentially transferring what belongs to the public, both the money and the education system, to a very small slice and leaving thousands and thousands of, of the most vulnerable Americans uh, in debt uh, with no education and with nothing, nothing to show for. This Bridgewater place employed 1,700 people to recruit new students. They employed one person to give career advice. <laughs> and so that, that's the kind of thing we're facing, and so the Obama administration tried to crack down on this, uh, and we saw the corporate constitutional rights game. They were sued. Uh, the, the GAO, the General Accounting Office, had given a report disclosing this information. They sued the, 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 the trade association of these, of Wall Street schools, sued the GAO for malpractice. <laughs> so I've never heard of a malpractice claim against the General Accounting Office, but you know, ha legal plausibility is not required. Right. Uh, they, and, and then they sued the, um, when the Obama administration proposed regulations to require at least some percentage of students to actually graduate and then have a job or be able to find a job. They were sued uh, claiming that the, uh, that regulation violated the constitutional rights of these corporations because it was vague, they said. And so that, and the regulations are still, they've been weakened now, they're, they're still locked up. We're getting no change, and that is typical of whether it's environment, education, energy, where we just get these terrible, scandalous things that don't change because when we try to change them, we run into the corporate power, corporate rights, quote unquote, campaign. And, and it's, um, it, it makes me frustrated, <laughs> and I hope, I hope it makes you frustrated because we've got to change it. I, we, we're paying a terrible price for it. Well, this is a question I probably should be answering, but I'm going to ask you, uh, why is this stuff, uh, yeah, the for-profit colleges, for example, why is that not a bigger scandal in the, in the press? I mean, it seems to me like a, a wonderful story, the kind of story that would have legs, a kind of story with uh, real villains, uh, real victims, these uh, young people who are not getting an education and uh, who I guess ultimately would default on these loans. Why is it not a bigger story? Uh, well, first, I, yeah, Bob, why? <laughs> 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 but I, I'd actually say first is due credit to, to your uh, former newspaper. Right. The New York Times has covered this story pretty well. They've, mm -hmm. they've had, uh, they, they both covered the, the Senator Levin hearings and chronicled some of this this terrible um, scandal of students being left in debt without any job prospects. Um, 
and, and the uh, extraordinary, extravagant CEO salary. So the Times did pretty well right. on it. Um, why it doesn't get bigger coverage nationally, I, I can't say. I think partly there's fatigue about there's so many scandalous things uh, that, and there's so media is so diffuse now that maybe it's, it's hard to get one story that gets legs. I think you know the Occupy movement was so good because it was everywhere willing to endure pain essentially to, and it, but it's, even that took a month before it was actually newsworthy. Um, whereas if you had 200 tea partiers gathering together, <laughs> it, it brought all the media at once. But uh, you know, I, I, it's a it's a tough question that I don't have the answer to, and I think we that's why we just have to keep pushing. We have to make it be a media narrative, and I think we have to bring it together, like the constitutional amendment campaign, and like uh, the uh, this this theme that about corporate power and corporations not being people because we have to stitch together these separate scandals uh, to, so people can see it's not really a scandal. It's what we've created. This is, this is how it works. If this is the kind of government we're going to be, this is what will happen. It's, and, and if we want to change it, um, hopefully we'll get the media coverage uh, around the broader picture that um, you know, the, the reason these keep hand happening, these, these terrible scandals, these economic meltdowns, these you know, uh, dis destruction of Appalachia is because we have a common problem behind it, which is this corporate power problem. So um, when you talk about uh, corporate power um, sort of um, having an effect on almost every aspect of our lives, you mentioned in the book that corporations are now in the schools advertising uh, in, in uh, most schools across the country. Uh, what's that about and why is that permitted? Well, it's about money, <laughs> like a lot of these. Um, and uh, it, 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 it is astonishing the extent of, of corporate influence. And partly it's the child marketing. We saw it with cigarettes. We see it with Coca-Cola and sodas and bad food. Um, it's trying to get, frankly, kids' dollars. And, and um, it's but another- how do, they, how do they advertise in school? Well, you know, there's places where Ronald McDonald the clown with the big leering <laughs> grin, you know, you, you think you'd think there'd be a background check on a guy who came into a school <laughs> dressed up with big shoes and big lipstick and but but he goes into schools and uh, and and he talks about the importance of character and fitness in, in schools, which is which is appalling. Uh, there's a school in Florida that had uh, McDonald's logo on their report cards. Uh, and you know part a lot of it is because, again, you know, the thing Demos was working so hard for, this restoration of the idea of the pub, there is a public good, and we need to support it. You know, we, there are schools serve all of us, and we need to support them with adequate funding. But the schools are desperate in some places. They don't have adequate funding. Corporations come in and they say, let's make a deal. Uh, they're branding school buses in some communities. The Los Angeles School District just voted to allow corporate deals essentially where they get a minimum amount of exposure to the, the kids and in exchange for money. Um, Channel One television you might have heard of has deals with thousands of schools where they beam in what they call uh, education for a couple of minutes and then they have a mandatory advertisement exposure and the contract in the Channel One uh, with the schools, I talk about it in the book, the contract actually says when they have to be shown uh, it has to be during a homeroom when a teacher is present. They, so, because they want to a make sure the kids see these advertisements. B, they want to make the implicit link to the teacher and the school. That if this is the teacher in the school saying drink Coca-Cola, then it must be good. It must be important part of our American life. And and that's what's so insidious about it. Uh, so it's again, we need to be vigilant, and we need we need to recognize this isn't sort of fringy, anti-corporate kind of views. This is pro, what, what kind of people are we? You know, what kind of country do we want to be? So you're leading this charge. Um, you're, you want to change the Constitution. You've written this book. You're going all over the country speaking out on this stuff. What's, uh, What's this done to your life? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you flatter me. There's a lot of leaders on this, uh, and, and some, many are in this room. Uh, uh, but I am, uh, what's it done to my life? It's changed my life, I guess. Um, 
I, I don't have as many corporate clients as I used to. <laughs> 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 um, but I, it's been a great, a great pleasure because, um, you know, I, and I think, as, as I said, if anyone, anyone brings to the table whatever they have, there's a great gratification and feeling like this country still has uh, what it takes to be a, a, a democracy and a government of the people. That you just, you meet people and you're so inspired by what they do. You, you, you see, you know, when John and I started up this Free Speech for People organization two years ago after Citizens United, you, you know, we surprisingly got some skepticism. Uh, <laughs> you're going to do what? A constitutional amendment? Uh, you're going to overturn Citizens United? And, you know, nobody would have guessed we would have a dozen constitutional amendment bills pending in Congress. We'd have two million people signed up. We'd have this broad coalition of organizations. We'd have resolutions in, from LA to New York and everywhere in between calling for an amendment. We would have a Montana Supreme Court essentially define the Citizens United case. And um, so uh, uh, my law practice isn't as busy as it was, but <laughs> I've taken up the slack in some other areas and it's very, very gratifying. And um, I, d I have more confidence than I ever did that we're gonna win this and that we have a chance to be involved in, in something historic that Amendments are, are not something we used to do and we don't do anymore. We've done amendments in the 20th century. Every single decade we amended the Constitution except the 40s and the 80s. Uh, the most recent was 92. So this is not sort of old, dusty, ancient history. This is what Americans do when the uh, democracy is on the line. It's how we got women the right to vote. It's how we elected senators, as I said. It's how we got equal rights uh, in voting and other places, no matter what your race was. So it is what we do if we want to succeed as a, as a democracy. And so personally, it's been very gratifying to be able to find a way to be part of that. Well, it's been gratifying having that.